I want to say never going to happen. The rich club, a nonprofit organization, or are we going to go after the landlord, or, or are we going to go after the landlord's property management company? So I, 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 I was keeping up with some big lawsuit about um, someone, one, some property management company, they, they, they kept putting off someone in a wheelchair who wanted to move from the second floor to the first floor. <laughs> they kept putting them off and then something happened and let's say he rolled them off the second floor. <laughs> um, the owners of that building did not get sued. It's the property management company that did. I, sometimes I feel like I have to give such extreme examples. To okay. Um, we'll keep just talking about content and more questions can come up as we um, wind down here. Um, I would just talk a little bit about negotiating and I, I think you really should have a broker in there. I owned a brokerage shop for 10 years in the commodities business, not in real estate, but I see the value in working with brokers. And when you're talking about this kind of money, um, it doesn't take much to set either side off. Everyone's nervous and has, has their concerns. Very few people think it's a win-win. You know, that, that BS about, you know, you want to negotiate and walk away and everybody's a win-win. Well, you know, I'm winning and they're losing, and that's the way it is. <laughs> <laughs> so have a broker in the middle. He's going to make, a, you know, he's going to make good money. Let him work for it. Uh, Sure. Yeah, buyer's broker, seller's broker. Even the seller's broker. This is hard to kind of to fathom, but yes, the seller broker has a fiduciary duty to the seller. And, and as long as you know that that seller is going to really work extra hard, I'm sorry, the broker is going to work extra hard for the seller, let's not BS ourselves. If that seller's broker is looking at a $50,000 commission, he's going to finesse the situation for both sides. It, you know, it's not going to be entirely a one-sided transaction. I've been involved in negotiations where I actually worked with the seller's broker, so I didn't pay the $100,000 fee to bring in the buyer's broker. So I did negotiate for myself, and I had my, my little counsel around me where you know, we made sure we were making the right moves. I think the value in a broker is to make, sh they make sure they protect you and also make sure that, that the negotiation always keeps moving forward. The seller's broker, without bringing your own representative as the buyer, is going to finesse that to make it happen. But you've you got to use some human nature here. If you really feel like something's wrong, well, then get out of the way. Everyone's new here. I want you to work with the buyer's broker. It's factored into the price. A little, little different for me. Okay. Know the story behind the story, why the property's being sold. I love this part of the business. You know, it's on the market. Well, great. What happened? You know, what happened? Who got hurt? Who lost it? Um, you know, just have they, have they tell you that? Because sure. Everyone's got to, you got to sell me something. I mean, coffee's for closers here. I'd never had a problem. Tell me, I mean, tell me the story about the building. I mean, ca capture my attention. I mean, th there's a sales process going on here, or, or your buyer's broker will know anyway. And then if that's the case, then the buyer's broker has a fiduciary responsibility to figure out what the hell's going on in the first place. Um, people don't mind sharing their stories. I mean, we're picking up distressed assets. And a lot of those banks know. I mean, we're the only ones buying them sometimes. So yeah, give them something really juicy. And you know what they'll do? Sometimes what they'll do right now is they'll put an asset on the market. I'll do, I'll, I'll do the, some of those ratios that we talked about this morning, maybe price per unit and stuff like that. And I think it's worth 15000 And they want to move it really quick. We well, you know what they're doing right now? Some of them will throw it out there for $5,000 a unit. Why are they doing that? To create a feeding frenzy feeding frenzy, because everyone like me, who doesn't have enough time to really look through all the deals, oh, 5000 a unit, I'll do that. And oh yeah, what's that story? You know, triple homicide and, and you know, Hurricane Ike damage and, and insurance problem. They'll, 
go dress that thing up. <laughs> Sorry to sound like that. I got to get off the homicide. <laughs> it's just I was going to buy this building a few months ago in Spring Branch. And um, this hedge fund beat me out, and I was very upset because I was totally thought it was mine. I qualified. I was qualified. I had the banks lined up, but it's a forty million, fifty million dollar little hedge fund. I didn't stand a chance. So um, a day before closing, there was a homicide on the property, and I just felt blessed that I wasn't part of that situation. Why did they appeal? Well. They went ahead and bought the property anyway, but I don't know. I'm thinking maybe lawsuits. I'm thinking, I'm thinking insurance rates. I'm thinking people are going to move out of there. Uh, all the numbers, all the numbers changed when someone fired that gun. And you know, if, if it wasn't in the contract, return my earnest money. Because I also knew what was going on, and they kept throwing more money at the deal to buy more time. So they were in it for at least $100,000. So they probably took a good hard look and said, we don't want to lose our $100,000. We have to go through with this. But if you use one of these clauses that we're talking about, and these are the things I share with you, you know, just stuff like that. So know the story behind the story. Know when to call it quits. I shared with you about you know how bad I wanted this uh, three to four hundred unit complex, and I just said a million dollars, three quarters of a million dollars on the roof. Forget about it. Can't do it. Why reason people are selling? Divorce, don't wanters, estate sales. I bought from all three of those. Poor management. I've definitely bought from there. Retiring. I haven't, but you know I read in all these. How to single family books, you know. Buy from someone who's retiring and then wants to move to Florida and pay sh play shuffleboard. Bankruptcy, um, definitely. 1031 exchanges. So I think they say you have 45 days to either identify a property or, or, or flip into a property. So some people are really pressed for time. They have 45 days before they have a massive um, tax liability that they're either going to buy or sell a property. So if you can get that information out of somebody when you're in negotiation, you can use it to your advantage. Find out the reason why they're selling. Oh, you have? Yeah. I've done 12. Um, it's kind of an interesting story. So that the apartment that I lived in in Hoboken, New Jersey, we had a we actually we had a view of the World Trade Center. Um, I watched it being built for a good six months. And long story short, it's kind of well, another way I got involved in this whole business because I moved with Canna Fitzgerald here. Um, so I had this apartment, comp uh, apartment complex. I had this apartment unit that I really couldn't afford. I think I paid 500 and like overnight when those towers came down, it was worth like 350 and nobody wanted to be down there. Everybody was afraid about what was going to happen next. And more importantly, people were concerned about what they were breathing in the air. I had to move, so I learned how to rent that apartment, condo, and that turned my whole life around because I, whatever I cleared, I don't remember if it was a few hundred or five hundred or a thousand right now, but I was like, oh my God. That was, so that's something great that came out of that devastating situation for me. Um, I'm telling you the story, so there, I found, I was at a point where I was struggling to keep it. I was indoctrinated into the land of renting out apartments, and I, I made it through that cycle, and I sold it for a profit, and that one apartment in Hoboken, New Jersey, exchanged into 12 Pasadena rentals for cash, because I bought those rentals right. I didn't buy $60,000, $70,000 rentals, I mean, I just, I just lined up a ton of foreclosures, a ton, a dozen. My wife would tell you I exaggerate a little. <laughs> I, I lined up a dozen. Okay, reasons people sell. And recession. I mean, that's where we, I mean, we're here right now. And you know what? I think it's going to get a lot worse over the next 12 months. But we're already in our repairing stage right now for, for C-class assets. It's happening right now. It's gonna, I don't care what happens. Double dip, triple dip, whatever they want to call it. It's going to be clean. Everything, all these non-recourse loans are going to work their way through the system. All these C-class assets that I'm talking about, are going to be scooped up, 
and, and they're going to all go away and they're all going to be rehabbed. You had a lot of pension, not pension, you had a lot of hedge funds out there over the last few years that were just waiting for what happened. Was it 1986 or something with, there, there was some, I can't remember the act, the whole SNL crisis, that whole thing. And then they came in and they took back all these properties and they sold it to individuals, literally pennies on the dollar. So you had a lot of funds licking their chops saying it has to happen again. It has to happen again. Scavenger funds, they're raising all this money. They're raising all this money and it still really hasn't happened because it's slowly working its way through the system right now. Maybe the government learned how to distinguish these properties in a different way and they learned from their mistakes. Um, so now you have these funds with these money and now they're starting to think like kind of what I'm teaching. Okay, well, what are our choices? Either give back all the money and we'll be out of jobs or go copy what Alan Schnurr is doing. <laughs> go buy these assets really cheap, fix them up. Let's cash flow them. I mean, we know our investors, they want more than 1%, don't they? They'll probably take 3 to 5%. And that's what you guys do out here. You give them, you're happy with 3 to 5% because you think they're different than me. Or you. And they're not. And that's what this is about. Matter of fact, you obviously have a lot more control over your properties than if you invested in their fund. Determining the offer price. Well, we've talked about appraised values and, and kind of how to find them. And um, comparable sales method, replacement cost. You're going to use capital, uh, an income approach, which, which is also known as the capitalization approach. Never show your best number when you want to buy something. Never. I mean, you might lose it, but you just can't, you just can't show your, your, your best number. It, it, they're stupid money. If someone wants to overpay, you've got to let them have it. doesn't mean you have to overpay, too. What I like to do is, um, actually, I learned this. Is there any Carlton Sheets? Anyone remember Carlton Sheets? He was like, like the granddaddy or, or the, the first guy ever up there trying to sell a single-family house course, no money down. And it, so Carlton Sheets, I remember one thing I got from Carlton Sheets, which was, if you're not embarrassed on how much you're offering to buy a property, then you're paying too much. So keep that in mind. If you're not embarrassed. I'm not saying I conduct my business like that all the time. But when lots of people were buying single-family houses for fifty, sixty, seventy thousand with hundred thousand dollar R, I was definitely buying them for twenty or thirty thousand dollars cash from my desk using Google. Don't speak first. Hard for some of us. I like to kind of put my finger right here and listen. If you ever see me doing that, I'm holding back. Okay, actual offers. Let's kind of start talking about the process. How does it begin? You identify a property. And you're really going to go after this one. It's LOI, letter of intent. LOI, letter of intent. And I supplied you with a few of the ones I used in the past. So and I, I, if it's not on the website, send me an email and I'll send it to you in a Word version so you can just have the template. Um, letter of intent. And then from that letter of intent, you're going to go into contract. And you're going to take that contract and you're going to be working with attorneys. And in that contract, hopefully you're going to have enough time to go inspect the property. Now. We can't go through this whole entire process right now, but by the time you get to an LOI stage, I'm hoping that you drove over to that property. You better. If you're working with a broker, you got to let that broker know that you put the time and effort into it or he's going to call me instead. All right, so you walk the property, you like it, you put an LOI on it, a contract comes back with the LOI, and you like the terms, and in the terms you see stuff for due diligence and escape clauses. We talked about a really good one just now, um, due diligence. Um, case study. Yeah. I want to go to due diligence and if we want to come back to this. So what is feasibility and due diligence? You can check anything you need to check at the end of the agreed upon time 
if it's time to fish or cut bait. So basically, it used to be 30, 60, 90 days. Well, that's too long. It used to be a good 30 days where you can get into contract and say, if I don't like this on day 30, I want all my money back. It's not happening right now. The market's moving too quick. These people that are selling the assets that I want you to buy, they're not going to wait for you because they're, they're bleeding cash. So you might get a week or two or three. Depends how bad you want the property. I think when we were negotiating, I think we said use two days or something uh, or two weeks. Two weeks. Oh, okay, maybe because we didn't have the funding lined up, so we were really trying to buy time. But um, I might just say a few days just to let them know how – how serious I am about buying this building. Well, Give me. It's going to take a few weeks. It's going to take a few weeks. Um, probably take you two to three weeks to adequately check everything, get your contractors over there. Um, but it doesn't have to be an over overwhelming task either. I mean, these contractors need business, so you need to contact. You need to get in touch with a few contractors. And say this is what I'm doing, you know, you know, get ready. Is there special contractors that are looking for apartments and they are for multi-homes or I would look for when you're trying to hire contractors to go look for apartments? Well, you actually want to see referrals and you want to maybe call some of them up. I, I would be very cautious on bringing your, your single family home contractors into the apartment business. When I told you a story, hang on a second. When I told you a story about one of my contractors opening up all my roofs because he thought it would be a good idea, you know, in the middle of January, the reality was he got behind on paying people, so he figured he it, he couldn't afford to ask me for more money because I knew I already paid him. So he just figured that he can just demolish things for the cheapest amount of money being spent. So. Long story short, he was a single-family house contractor, and I gave him a very big responsibility on replacing like five structural roofs, and it cost me over $100,000, that mistake. So maybe everybody will remember that mistake now that I made. You want to make sure – here's what I really learned from that lesson. Hire a roofing company to do your roof. Hire an electrician company to do your electrical work. And hire a plumbing company to do your plumbing. I thought I can get in there with my single-family house guys that have been working for me for a decade. Um, there's a good place and time for them. I mean, I told you, what did I say, $175, paint inside and you know, paint. We do that with my, my single-family house guys. My structures, I paint for $1,500 a piece. Unbelievable. That's just the deal I have with them. Pay you $1,500. Here are the colors. They'll be delivered. ICI paints or glidden now. You might want to write that down. And you mentioned rich. When you're part of organizations like this too, you get massive discounts. So make you know whatever it is, if it's AAA or, or rich, I'm not sure what rich discounts are, but I'm sure I'm, I'm, it should be there. You get like a 50% off of the cost of paint. So they'll deliver the paint to your properties too. You want to look for all these efficiencies. Stay out of your car. Um, so you can bring your single-family house guys in to do, you know, the carpet tile and paint stuff and save a fortune. But I've learned through experience, hire a professional electrician company, hire, pro hire a professional plumbing company, and hire a profession professional roofing company. But those are still just for the but apartment or for houses. Even the yeah. Well, you want to make sure they're commercial. commercial. They can handle commercial. If some guy pulls up in his station wagon and asks for 50% up front, run. I mean, that's all there is to it. They should have 30, 60, 90 days credit. You know, run your business like I, I hope you run your – I'm not paying for anything up front. If you need my money up front, then you're not the person we should be doing business with because you don't know how to run your business. You should have your own credit lines. So, you know, um, never show up on site with a checkbook. You'll just break your own machine. I have bookkeepers and accountants and stuff like that. And when I used to get out there and write checks and I'm all – you know, flustered and everyone coming at me and I'm dealing with the elements. I don't use a register. You know, I try to scribble something down there and if you notice, I haven't picked up a pen all day because I don't have very good penmanship. So, um, but when you're in feasibility and you're on this timeline, they'll show up. They want the job. They want the job bad. They'll give you an estimate and hopefully that will help you determine if, if, if it's within your budget. Go ahead, ask. Oh, 
sorry, Arturo. Sorry, is it possible for what? Yes, quotes. quotes. Estimates. Yeah. I mean, think about it. If you owned a roofing company and I called you up and I said, I'm thinking, I'm real serious about buying this building. Can you come look at it for me? And, you know, the guy would have to be nuts not to come up. Some might say, I want money. But that, that's, that's not right. Not right now in this economy. I, you know, if they were overwhelmed and they had more business than they knew what to do with, then I guess it's supply and demand. But right now, there's, there's a lot more of them than you. So I'm going to take you through a timeline if you had 30 days to close. But the real purpose of this exercise is to kind of share with you what needs to be done during a due diligence process. So it all starts with the effective date when basically the contract's signed and there's an effective part of that contract that has a date on it. You might be in contract negotiation for weeks, if not months. So obviously, the time didn't start uh, ticking back then. It starts on the effective date. And it's important because you're going to be putting down money that might, but you're going to be putting down money that won't be refundable after the effective date or after the due diligence period is over. So everybody wants to be really clear where they are in their timeline. Well, let's just say this, since I'm not an attorney. The effective date is the date we all agree on when the cl clock starts ticking right. for, the, for your due diligence, so your due diligence. Well, it starts ticking for the due diligence. Yes. Um, so all parties have signed and dated. Send over a contract and earn us money. Okay. Getting ready to do your first walk. I like to show up with a few people. You better really start lining up those contractors, business partners, bankers. Determine which inspections you need first. If I'm walking onto a property where I do have to make the choice, Arturo, where maybe there's someone I have to pay, Maybe I want to get some kind of certified inspection. Um, I'm going to have to decide, is that the first, first person I want to call first or if I want to call last? And let me tell you why I might call them last. Because maybe I want to get the roof estimate first. Maybe it's a thousand times worse than I could have ever imagined. Then I don't need to spend money. Okay, So you've got you to feel the situation out when you're, going, when you're going through these inspections and be very diligent about your timeline. Um, no sense in paying for qualified inspectors to come aboard if stuff that you could have had inspected for free is a lot worse than you ever imagined could be. Um, yes? Before the, uh, before you put in your offer, you have already taken in the building and you looked at it and you don't want to be asking them where it's at. You just said you have that for a year. Uh, the numbers are set. Right. Yes, because you're going to get inside. You didn't really get inside. So before you, you did your offer, perused it. You just looked. You perused it, it, yeah. You know, or you know, even in distress situation, none of my other students are here right now. We went out and looked at. Um, it was like a five hundred thousand dollar complex, and I was bored, and I was really going to go buy it. I just wanted a project. And I was going to pay cash for it, and I was, you know, it was kind of a tight deal. Um, I was watching this for a few months, and it, it fell. At a bank was taken over by the FDIC, and they got these portfolios. And dealing with the FDIC is like they only reduce the price five or ten percent a quarter, no matter what. They don't care. They don't care. Maybe it's only worth two hundred thousand. Well, according to the FDIC. That's going to take six and a half years before you get it for what it's really worth. <laughs> That's our government. That that's right, and that's why we're here today, and that's why everybody's really working hard. So, um, okay, I didn't mean to kind of dig that in. So I was going to buy, I was going to really buy it, and it did turn out that um, um, 
it was so much worse than I could ever imagine. Uh, the yes, I got inside. I got inside. Thank you for getting me. I got inside, and um, I mean, I was literally falling through the floors. Like, yeah. It, let's just say there's a rule in my house about what I'm allowed to wear back into the house after I go out to places like that, and that was a code five or whatever she calls it. <laughs> <laughs> so, because you don't want anything crawling around in your own house. I mean, that's that that would cost me five thousand dollars if anything ever. All right, sorry. I'll keep those stories uh, out of this, but you can get to like the fleas and oh, no. sorry. <laughs> yeah. No. So, um, right. So, I mean, there's only so much you can do from <laughs> what. <laughs> so. I, I don't read signs. I don't follow directions. That's just who I am. I mean, my wife's embarrassed to go out me half the time. You know, there was um, my son's, we had an ice cream social at his school the other night, and I couldn't believe, like, the miles of cars there were everywhere was at the same time. I just pulled right up in the fire lane and parked my car and walked right into the building. And a few of her friends were standing there, and she was just so embarrassed. I didn't get a ticket. There was no parking space. I mean, that's really the reality. So, yeah, you're out. It's your time. I'm not out driving over property. If I can, I mean, do, don't get hurt. I like to go with a partner and walk around with a flip camera and, and kind of make it really clear. Maybe get a clipboard and look like an inspector. So, I mean, when I used to go out for in Pasadena, look at my houses. I can't tell you how many times Pasadena police stopped me. They thought I was breaking in. I'm not driving 30, 40 miles to get there. I, I got to know if someone's living in my house or not. And, you know, so there I am, and the, the car I drive, that car has 100,000 miles on it, and, and I look like I live, or I look like I might be stealing a condenser or something in Pasadena. So I'm like, thank you very much. Oh, but by the way, I own this apartment building. Someone's selling drugs, and I've been coming down to the police department, and you guys haven't done anything. So you ask someone to do something, they leave you alone really quick. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. Um, get bids from contractors. Okay, let's get to the timeline. Okay, so here's what I like to do within the first seven days. Start working on your loan applications. Start working on your resume, whatever it is. Make it look really good. We don't expect you to have experience doing this, but I'm sure you kicked ass at something at one point in your life. So go ahead, tell the truth. Don't be bashful. Have two to three years tax, tax returns ready to go. I can't even tell you, I can't even tell you how much more prepared I've always been than my competition. I mean, if you ever meet up with a mortgage broker, they'll tell you what a nightmare it is to deal with clients and, and people bring their shoe boxes in and their tax returns. Put it all on a thumb drive. You'll never have to worry about it again. Put it all on a thumb drive. Um, what I used to do, people used to ask me, Alan, how'd you borrow so much money to buy 102 houses? I used to walk around with five years of tax returns in a binder. And I would just give it to the banker. He knew exactly what he wanted. Works well, well, it works well for the apartment business too, but I've discovered over the last year what a thumb drive is. Proof of liquid funds, for those of you that can do that. Um, I think you should have your banker send it to you all the time. I have one sent to me every month. I've helped some people in this room use my proof of funds. We can talk about stuff like that as we get more involved in the program. Three years of P&L on the property from the seller. Right? It's time, too. You've got to discover what's real or what's bullshit. You've got to really start going through his records. You don't have to be an expert, but something's going to stand out. I mean, um, what did we discover? We discovered the other day at this apartment building we were looking at that it had a ridiculous water bill of four. And I know that it's only cost 20 to 
thirty dollars at most a door in the whole entire. And, and so he's got a, a four thousand dollar water bill on on a building. So oh, wow. we haven't really figured it out, and apparently we don't need to figure it out until he's first in line again. But I'm sure there's a broken pipe. You know, the meter's not spinning out of control. We checked. But that's what well, we're just talking about due diligence. Some, something, you know, standing out. Um, you might need an environmental inspection. Let's not spend too much time talking about it. Most banks want them done. They cost approximately $1,500. And if that's the case and you have a really good feeling about this building, you got to move on the environmental inspection because it's going to take some time. You want to look at the current rent roll. And again, when you work with me, I'm going to really teach you how to do a lease audit. Simple. You want to make sure that someone's not renting out a unit to their mother-in-law on a 10-year lease at a dollar or something. And then you buy the building and you have to honor that lease. Just stuff, ridiculous stuff like that. Someone asked me about uh, software, Blue Moon software. Most of us use it in the apartment business. It's a great way of handling your leases. These uh, TAA leases, they come up online, and you just, I mean, you just pop in the field. It's so easy. It's online, press print. There's one for the tenant. There's one for you. And a great way of staying organized. Blue Moon software. Market rent survey. Um, the market rent survey, you want to know you want to know what the other apartments are renting for in the area. You want to know if you have a deal or not. I mean, it might be a screaming deal, but if everybody's renting out their units in the area at a price that you can't stay in business, well, unfortunately, you're going to have to let them go out of business first before you get involved. So within nine days, I'd like to get my hands on a Schedule E from the seller, if you guys can do that, because he can't really BS on his taxes. Um, I want to see if I can get the income and the expense reports for the last three years on the property. And it really helps us figure out what's been fixed and what hasn't been fixed and what's been capitalized or what's been expensed. There's a lot to say about capitalized expenses, a cap capitalizing and expenses, and we'll just talk about it for a second. When you capitalize something, it's like a once-in-a-lifetime thing, and it's like buying a furnace or a boiler or a new roof. And it doesn't hit up on your P&L every month. If you expense it, it's what a lot of us do with our single family houses. Um, we just run it through our books. We don't, we don't try to depreciate it over time. We don't do anything right. And you let it affect the way your monthly income looks for that month. So for example, if you had a $10,000 profit and you didn't capitalize a roof, and you decided to expense it for $10,000, then you made zero that month, accounting-wise. That's all we'll go into that. OK, so you want to know, you want to see a list of recent improvements. You want to know, you want to see an inventory list. You want to know what's, what's coming with that deal. I've seen uh, it's sewer machines, carpet machines. I've seen golf carts. I've seen computers. They all seem to disappear right before closing. <laughs> so I want to know from here on out. I want to know if I'm getting a golf cart or not, because I got screwed in the last one. Um, take a look at the water, gas, and electric bills. Lease audits, inventory of personal property, keys relating to the property. You want to really look into that, because keying could be very expensive. It can cost 50 to to $100 per unit if you don't take care of it. So hopefully no one's being malicious and all your keys will be there. Just find out where they are. Insurance policies. I would call. I actually do this right away now. Um, call your call insurance broker up. I use Ted Allen and Associates, I believe, here in Houston. And I also use... Mid-Continental Insurance, which I believe is a rich vendor, and he'll take good care of you. Jack? 
Um, I, I said mid-continental. I give you his phone number, everybody. Uh, yeah, um, mid-continental is definitely more residential, uh, single-family residential. And Ted Allen and Associates, I'm sorry, it's on my other phone. Ted Allen and Associates is more commercial. But believe me, I mean, mid-continental, they'll try to sell you anything. So, um, Okay, insurance policy. Income and expense statements, get your hands on those. Year-to-date P&L. Tax statements, right? You're going to start working on looking into fighting that tax bill. Decide how many units will be inspected. I really want to try to inspect everything. I kind of, I've created a, like a class out of it. Whenever I'm getting ready now to walk in a apartment building and call up all my students, and I, I you know, I cr try to create something fun, and it's educational for everybody. And believe me, the unit that you can't get into is going to be the unit that's burnt inside. So remember that. Um, Research all long-term contracts involving the property. I already told you about the coin mat contracts out there. There's other, pro other contracts that might still exist. See if you can get bank deposits. Can't really lie about that. You're going to be working with an attorney to create the purchase and sales agreement. Watch out for long-term service contracts associated with the property where fees paid to the property owner in advance. Try to negotiate to um, get some kind of proration. Same thing, just 10-year lease. You're in my program. We're working together. I can't believe anybody would buy a building here without me involved, so I'll be more than happy to help. Okay, so um, in the last, let's just say in the last 18 months, well, I don't know what the number is, say it was six. Got it with Lake Jackson. Three of them didn't have them, and three of them did. Okay, the que I'm sorry, I'm repeating the question, which was, here I am telling everyone to go out and look for those distressed assets, and that's really how we're going to get ahead of the game in life. You know, there's really not a lot of documentation that comes along with those properties. There might be some, but you'll know how to ask. You're still going to have to go through the due diligence um, and make your tr decision. But yeah, most likely, you're not going to get your hand on the bank statements. You're not going to get your hands on, on the utilities and stuff like that. But if you know what you're looking for, you might be able to go talk to the city about it, or you might be able to talk to the utility company about it and you know, figure it out. Gonna kind of, you're going to look at the roofs. You're going to look at the HVAC. You're going to look at the parking lots. You're going to look at the swimming pool. You're going to look at the po uh, boilers. You're going to look at the foundation. You're going to look at the plumbing. And you're going to look at the electrical. Yes? There's reports that you can have done for you. They will factor in the, I don't do this, but I'm just telling you, because I'm getting what I'm getting. But if you, you know, um, some banks want to know the question, the answer to your question. And I'm not sure if I pulled that slide out or not. Can't remember, it's not the BOV, but it's, it's another company that gets out there and gives you the exact estimate on their professional experience on what lifespan is left in those kind of 
um, utilities on the property. And the second part of your question was, well, do I actually have some kind of checklist while I'm doing all this? Or, or no? I, sh sure, I do. I mean, um, I, you go look at a boiler. There's, there's a serial number on it, and you can have someone call that in, or there's a date on it. I, I know this isn't much of a consolation, but it either looks like crap, and you're going to have to buy or buy a new one. Um, or have one on standby. So in a building that I just took over, we bought, I, I think there's three boilers. We bought one, we have one on standby, and we're keeping the two. Because you can't really tell. Just so everybody knows, those boilers are, they're actually recorded with the state of Texas. So not only will you get a city inspection, you have to get a state inspection in the state knows a lot about your boiler. You might want to write that down. So within the first 15 days, you got to make a decision if you're going to keep the staff there or not. They're going to bring a property management company. So you might want to start interviewing the people there and find out what their intentions are. I found in the situation where how I'm buying apartment buildings right now that a lot of those property management companies are incentivized to stay. They get bonuses when the properties are being sold. So be prepared. And they're going to they're going to candy coat the situation and make it sound better than it is. But at the same time, they might be looking for a job. And I found some good people that way. And here's what's really good about that: in one of my buildings that I bought, I hired the property management company, and I didn't go through that 10% decline that I always saw when taking over buildings. Which leads me to believe that managers have special deals with tenants. Cause, but I mean, there was no, well, I didn't see any special deals, but um, yeah, I won't go into that. So Alan, yeah. do you consider this a risk that you can, a facility can incur whether or not, a factor of something that would be raised whether or not the management staff and the employees are a problem in the first place? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it so happens when, when sometimes when we're buying these properties um, in receivership, they're, they're being run by property management companies, and there's not a lot of money going into these properties, right? And the bank doesn't really want to pay for all the upkeep of the building to keep all the tenants happy. And when you come across one where I said to you the average expense to run a, 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 a door in a C-class business is probably around $4,000. A year. So when I'm looking at someone's financials and they're they're doing it for twenty seven fifty, they're doing it for twenty seven fifty. I'm liking that. So and that, and that's I hired those guys. So sometimes you know it, it just runs so mean and lean, and they're used to not having available funds, and it looks beautiful. That's a winner. Okay, review financials. Make make a pro forma. Um, decide if you want to proceed or renegotiate. So we call it retrading the deal. Retrading the deal. Do you, I don't know, are you, is it what you thought it was? Or, I mean, we, we looked at something last week, Don and I, and, and, and the listing, they were throwing in a house that was valued at $60,000, which I didn't really want anyway. But when we got there, they sold the house and they didn't change the price of the building. Um, so that's what I would call retrading the deal. I mean, give me my sixty thousand dollars back. Within the first three weeks, lease audit. You want to verify it. You're gonna you're gonna have walked all the units, so you're gonna be able to tell if someone's really living there. Some people like to actually match up the names. I don't go as far as that. Current rent rolls, you're going to prepare an analysis, you're going to create a pro forma, you're going to now start looking at your debt service coverage ratios, you're going to start looking at the cash flows. Some people go wrong with this, they don't do it, you should. What's your business plan? 
I know I'm throwing a lot at you, but what's your business plan? It could be a paragraph. Because your bank's going to want to see your business plan, not because they're sitting there trying to grade it to you, grade it, but you need to give your banker some ammunition to walk into his committee meeting that he has every Wednesday at 3 o'clock in the afternoon and stand up and say, hey, gentlemen, listen to this deal. You know, and he's, he's got your business plan. He's selling you. Okay? Entity structure. We could talk a weekend about entities, but here's how I do it. Uh, basically, I have an LLC for everything. Seems to be the popular way of doing things right now. They're easy, quick, uh, set up. Uh, bizfilings.com. Do it really quick. What I like about bizfilings.com is that I have an L a lot of LLCs. And they're all online. So if ever you like, need like an EIN number, um, I can just get online. It's all there. It's awesome. Uh, bizfilings.com. Bizfilings.com. They're very, um, it's, it's, it's relatively inexpensive. I think most of the fees are just the filing fees with the state. It's time to start talking about a management agreement. Are you going to keep the management company there? Are you going to bring one in? And it's time to start negotiating. Um, I pay my management company 3%. It's pretty cheap. 3 to 6% standard out there. I'm sure we're, we're building new businesses together, and I'm all for paying him more money when I'm making more money. And he's going to help. Start hiring employees. You've got to set up your vendors. Don't just walk into a, a new situation and, and just feel elated that you're so lucky because someone left their Rolodex on your desk. I would, I would contact all those vendors or have your property management company contact all those vendors and say there's a new sheriff in town and, you know, if you want to do business with us, first of all, we're, we're going to renegotiate. And second of all, don't ever send me a bill that needs to go to someone else, the prior owner. I'm not paying it. You know, that's it. I'm a new owner. And, and that's it. We'll see if we can do business or not. Don't just take it for granted. I walk into a, a situation where someone costs charged me like seriously like twenty seven hundred dollars to cut my grass for a month and that's that was that one got away from us so that one got away from and we we had to pay it so i went from twenty seven hundred to like six hundred dollars or something was that a it wasn't a long-term contract it was just a, sometimes these banks or the receivers will just you know somebody will overcharge a bank or a receiver and it just got away from us as the new owners yeah, definitely. That you can. Um, a make ready plan. I need you to, well, you're going to have to learn. How, how are you going to, maybe you have five or 10 or 15 units that aren't online. So it's time to come up with a plan, and we need to talk about, you know, how are you, what's going to be the color code? What's going to be the scheme? Um, I like to stay with the same color throughout the whole complex. Make sure it's written down so no one's scattering to figure out what color, eggshell, white, or, or whatever uh, finish. So we use the same color throughout all of my buildings and actually all of my houses. That saved me so much time and money and trouble. Use the same colors for everything. Matter of fact, I started painting the exteriors of all my houses the same colors. I almost own 100 baby blue houses. <laughs> you, you might think I'm Greek. Oh, so uh, you're working with your insurance company. Um, you can start getting binders. You don't have to p actually pay for it, but they'll lock you in, and you can have insurance. So you want to get that binder quote, and you want to lock it in, even though if you haven't paid for it yet, and you'll have a few days to actually take care of that. I don't know, I don't do that. Hang on. More financials. Okay, so I'm, I'm just going to pull out the stuff that I think that's pretty important. Do I want this property in my portfolio? Do I want it? You're, you're, you're in your due diligence. It's time to kind of say, is this an emotional thing? Did I fall in love with this? Or is it going to fit? Is it going to work? You need to make that decision. 
we know why you got involved. And, you know, you're here at the course. That's great. But now it's time to decide, is it really going to, you know, help you retire quicker? All right, hang on, guys. So we're kind of coming to the close here, even though, actually, well, you guys want to see a few YouTube videos of being in the field, or have you had enough? Yeah? yeah? OK, yeah. all right, all right. OK, no sleeping. How about you want to take a five-minute stretch? Because it'll probably take you five minutes to...